Hi, I'm Metta Nanda, a Samanera monk here at Dhammasukha Meditation Center. And today I'm lucky to be joined by Delson Armstrong, who's a friend, a meditation teacher. He's leading uh, retreats all around the world and a very experienced yogi and meditator. He's actually been collaborating with elite neuroscience labs um, all over the world in Amsterdam and soon in Harvard, at Harvard. And he's um, actually in, in this episode, we'll have a cool visual demonstration of Delton's brainwaves using the Muse, which is a consumer uh, EEG, which basically is a headband, uh, as you'll see soon, that can measure Delson's brain while he meditates. And uh, most recently, Delson is the author of a book called titled "A Mind Without Craving." So, Delson, welcome to the welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. Th Thanks for having me. Good to be here. So, I think that'll be a good place to start with the title of your book, "A Mind Without Craving." What does that mean? Yeah, a mind without craving. So, when we talk about a mind without craving, what we're saying is it's a mind that's happy all the time. And the reason I say that is because if you look at it from the context of the practice that we do here, we're looking at it from what's known as the Four Noble Truths, which is suffering, the cause of suffering, the cessation of suffering, and the way leading to the cessation of suffering. And a mind without craving is the Third Noble Truth, which is the cessation of any kind of suffering, which means you cease the craving. And when we talk about craving, craving is basically that mind that grasps at something from a sense of self. It says, I like it, or I don't like it, or I am it. And it manifests as tightness and tension in the head and in the body. So a mind without craving is basically a mind that has no mental suffering at all. It will still feel pain. It will still feel bodily pain, it will still feel bodily discomfort, it will still have unpleasant feelings, but there won't be any mental agitation because of it. Mm. So there won't be any grasping, there won't be any kind of reactivity to it. And so that mind without craving is basically a mind that is relaxed all the time, that has relief all the time, and is happy all the time. Beautiful. I mean, this sounds like something that we would all want. And uh, I think it's kind of radical what you're saying, because most people don't realize that's even a possibility. I mean, it's just kind of accepted that part of the human condition is that there's this perpetual cycle of kind of dissatisfaction and then striving to get something in the future that might make us happy, experiencing some joy here and there, but really uh, looking for things a lot of the time. And the meditation traditions have traditionally this big promise that you can have a mind without suffering. But I don't think a lot of people even realize that's possible. So how did this come about for you? If, if you're able to just kind of walk us through like the last kind of cognitive shifts that occurred for you when doing the meditation practice. Right. So first we should understand that when we talk about this meditation practice, what really differentiates it from other meditative practices, uh, the majority of meditation practices, is that there is what's known as the relaxed step. So the way to apply the meditation uh, is basically observing an object of meditation and you remain collected in that object of meditation. When your mind gets distracted, when your mind moves away from it, you use the six R's. And at the heart of that is what's known as relax. So very briefly put, the six R's is recognizing when you got distracted, releasing your tension from it, relaxing any tightness and tension, that's the craving or agitation, coming back to a smile to uplift the mind, and returning back to your object. Yeah. And in the six is repeat. So that was the application of effort that I did. So it was very relaxed, very open, very spacious in terms of the mindset and the awareness. Because of that, my mind was able to actually get really deep into the practice and in a very relaxed manner. There comes a point in the meditation for everyone where there is a really uh, wonderful, joyful cognitive shift that happens. And this happens when the mind first 
completely shuts off, as it were. There's no consciousness there. There's no awareness there. And when it comes back online, there is this rush of joy and relief that is experienced. And as a result, when you come out of the meditation and you look around you, everything seems very hyper vivid. It's everything is much cleaner, as it were. There's no impediments. You know, before you see a tree and yeah, you see it's a tree. That's great. But after this cognitive shift, you look at the tree and you actually see each and every detail of the leaf of that tree and the bark of that tree or each blade of grass or each curvature of clouds in the sky. You know, it's very hyper re detailed. And the way I look at that, the way I understand it is that the mind in that, in that time has let go a lot of craving, let go of a lot of suffering. So there's no more of this filtration system or the filter, as it were, has been cleaned up. Yeah. So you can see reality as it actually is. Amazing. So, um, you know, the, the way you describe this in your book, I think, is pretty beautiful. Uh, you say the mind of an arhat, which is someone who's fully awakened, is completely free from all concepts. When he or she experiences reality as it is through the six sense bases, so this is the five senses and then also the mind, uh, consciousness, feeling, and perception, all these processes are completely empty, completely void. They're empty of any conceit of I, me, or mine. When an arhat experiences reality, there is no conceptual proliferation that arises from any perception that arises. It is being experienced in that moment through the sense and the sense faculties. Their consciousness, the awareness, is still functional, but it is void of any sense of self. So this no self experience, or not self experience, is also commonly talked about in different meditation traditions. But I think it's a very confusing one for people because they just look down at their body and they think, you know, it's pretty obvious that there's a self here. So what does that actually mean experientially to not feel like anything is self. Yeah. So when we talk about self and not self or no self, but it's really not self, which is you understand that everything is just empty of any kind of personal self. You realize that everything is a process or a series of processes that are just causes and conditions to right. bring about that experience. Here, for someone who becomes fully awakened, they experience the world in such a way that there is no more, as it's written there, conceptual proliferation or mental proliferation. So yeah. we could take the example of a chocolate cake, yeah. right? Somebody, somebody who's not fully awakened or not awakened at all looks at chocolate cake and there can be all of these ideas around that chocolate cake. Like, you know, my mother used to bake me this kind of chocolate cake, or I remember having this chocolate cake at this particular restaurant or bakery, or, you know, I wonder how many calories are in a slice of chocolate cake, or I wonder what kind of chocolate is used in that kind of chocolate cake. All of these different ideas, you know, and this is, this is the process of the default mode network. So on an experiential level for the, for the awakened mind, they just see chocolate cake. Hmm. Now their mind, you know, they're, they're, they might be habituated towards enjoying chocolate cake, but you take away the chocolate cake from them and they won't get affected by it one way or the other. But to know if a mind is filled with craving is, oh, they dig into the chocolate cake, you snatch it away from them and look at their reaction. Yeah. They will feel agitated by it. So coming to that idea of craving, you know, we talk about it in terms of you know, this agitation as well, the mind that tightens up over something, around something. And then you look at that object of craving and then you, you know, you take that and you enjoy it and then you feel relief. But that mind without any craving, that mind of the arahant is basically in relief all the time, relaxed all the time. So they don't need anything to make them happy as it were. Right. Their mind is always happy. It's, right. a, it's, it's independent. It's liberated from the need or desire to enjoy something, the need or desire to have another object that, that will create happiness. Internally, they are filled with joy. 
internally they are filled with uh, relief, internally they are filled with equanimity. So there's no conceptual proliferation going on. When you see things as they are, what it's saying is, in the seeing, you're only seeing it as it is. There is this filtration system, which is you know, filtered by the craving, filtered by what's in it for me? How does this benefit me? Or what can I get out of this? All of that is based in conceit. And for the fully awakened mind, they don't see it in that way. They don't have an agenda. Right. So they can fully enjoy things as they are uh, without having to add a layer or superimpose a layer of a sense of personal self. Right. Yeah, so, I mean, this is, I think, intuitive for a lot of people, what you're saying, the sense that we're always seeking for happiness out there, looking for things to satisfy us. And we do this all day long. We do it on a micro level, whether it's just adjusting the position in our chair to get away from something that's unpleasant or moving towards and wanting more of something that's pleasant like the chocolate cake. And we do it on a macro level, which is seeking the new house, the new job, the new partner that we think will finally make everything okay in our life, will finally be happy. And that might be true for some time, but then the mind just wants more of whatever it is that's pleasant or it wants to get rid of unpleasant things, people we don't like, situations we don't like. And so what you're describing, this mind without craving, this awakened mind is really a mind that's content no matter what's going on. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's content all the time. Okay. Now, you know, we have to differentiate between, let's say, bodily pain and mental pain. So in the case of somebody who's not fully awakened, they will still have mental pain. We talk about this in the form of the two arrows or the two darts. Somebody feels pain, that's just the bodily pain, but then they add to it some kind of agitation. And that's where the reactivity and trouble mm -hmm. starts. But for the awakened mind, there's only the bodily pain. So they will still feel pain. They will still feel some kind of discomfort. Right. But there's no sense of anger or irritation or right. sadness or grief associated with that pain. Right. Likewise, you know, or on the flip side of that, if it's a pleasant feeling, they won't like grasp around it. Yeah. So I would venture to say that for the fully awakened mind, they don't have any sort of, you know, I, I would think that their dopamine and serotonin levels are completely balanced yeah. in that sense. They're not like always looking for the next fix, right. as it were. Right. Yeah. I mean, so the way this works with the chocolate cake example, for example, is when someone has already experienced chocolate cake, when they just at the mere sight of it again, their dopamine reward system is going to start going, create this uncomfortable urge to go get some chocolate cake to satisfy that kind of agitated feeling. The cake will taste good, but it's really the relief that comes from finally feeling like, okay, that uh, agitation is gone. And it sounds like in the awakened mind that no longer happens. Um, and it also sounds like the, you've mentioned proliferation where we're just constantly layering on layers of abstraction from raw data in the world. So like we look at something, but we don't see it as it is. We see all of our memories of it and how it can benefit us in one way or another and what we expect it to be and how we want more of it or less of it or, you know, even like extreme emotions towards it um, instead of just like the f color and form that's there in our awareness. Yes. Yes. And so even the awakened mind will have perception, which is to say they will have memory of, uh, you know, this is, uh, you know, this is a person that I know from, from my friendship or from my childhood or whatever it might be. But that's where the layer of uh, experience stops. Yeah. Beyond that, there's no like grudge being held against them or there's yeah. no like, oh, this person did this to me or did that to me. You know, we t take a look at this, for example, this pen, right? This pen for us as humans is a writing instrument. For a dog, it would be a chew toy. Yeah. So, you know, it's, you will still perceive it as it actually is. You'll still say, okay, this is a pen. <laughs> but beyond that, it won't say, oh, this is a specific type of pen, which I only like. Yeah. Or my father gave me this pen, so it has some kind of emotional value to it. 
Right. So those kinds of projections are gone yeah. in the awakened mind. Right. So you're not going to cry and wail when the you know you lose the pen, but you're also not going to start chewing on it. <laughs> 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 so, so that's good. That's reassuring. Uh, so, all right. This is kind of a I don't know a spicy question, but would someone rather be a fully healthy, happy celebrity? Because a lot of celebrities aren't happy, but at least people think think they are. So let's pick a celebrity who, you know, actually is pretty happy, yeah. and they've just they've got everything they they want materially. They've got the you know the attractive partner and all that for one hundred years, or in the awakened mind for a single day. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a no brainer. Because you, you think about having a fully awakened mind. You know, we talk about a celebrity, right? Let's say we talk about a celebrity who's extremely healthy, seems to be happy. Mm -hmm. But, you know, fame is what defines a celebrity, which means that yeah. there's somebody who's well-known, somebody who's yeah. celebrated in society. But for what reason? Because they're idolized for some kind of ideal that they represent. Whether they're coming from the movies and they... so personify a specific type of character or music, you know, or they, they, they are celebrated as somebody who is an artist or a writer or a politician or somebody who's made some great change in the world. Yeah. That's all well and good, but, you know, I, I look at it from today's society, fame has become a currency and it's become an emotional currency and fame can be detrimental. Yeah. You know, fame can be detrimental to one's mental well-being. Yeah, certainly. So, people who try to want to be famous, they have all of these grand ideas about what it means to be famous. But uh, th those very same things then become detrimental to yeah. what they thought was fame. So, I guess for the for the sake of this thought experiment, maybe celebrity was the wrong term to pick, but someone who just has every material possession they sure. they could want in terms of the car, the partner, the job, the, you know, nice food, nice house, sure. they can travel anywhere. Yeah. Would you rather want a hundred years of that or one one day with a mind that's awakened in terms of how much I guess joy you would get from it or whatever? Yeah, like I said, it's a no brainer. It would be yeah. the single day. And the reason I would say that is because you're already happy. Yeah. <laughs> Your happiness is not dependent upon that car or dependent upon your bank balance or dependent upon your family or dependent upon having a life that you always wanted. Because having a life that you always wanted, there is that want, you know, yep. that's the craving. And so your mind is dependent upon all of these things and people and relationships. But imagine a mind that's just happy for the sake of being happy. Yeah then you give them anything, they're happy. You give them a small little bowl of food, they're happy. Or you give them an entire smorgasbord of food, and they're happy too. doesn't matter. I guess also what I'm getting at is, is that happiness to some extent, like even more so than a mundane level of yes. joy that someone would experience? Just, you know, pick some, like your average person on their best day of their life. Or right, something. right. Yeah, let's say an average person on their best day of their life, they have that uplifted joy, they have that uplift, uplifted feeling. Mm -hmm. And it's quite possible that that feeling is internal and not dependent upon things outside in terms of the sixth sense basis. So that's a, that's a wonderful kind of happiness to be it. But imagine that where it's not even dependent upon how the mind is experiencing anything. In other words, there can be physical happiness happiness that is the gratification of the five physical senses. And there can be mental happiness, which we talk about from our practice as being associated with jhanas, yep. these states of meditative uh, uh, experiences that allow us to experience joy and happiness and clarity and equanimity and tranquility and contentment and so on. But we're going even one step further than that and saying that you have experienced the ultimate happiness Mm. So the way to look at it is it's like layers or levels of happiness. Right. And the fully awakened mind has gotten to the pinnacle of happiness. So everything else compared to that, it's, you know, it's not worth it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is mega happiness. This you know, is this mega, is, mega 
ginormous happiness. <laughs> <laughs> See, I think that's way better marketing than the end of suffering yeah. for some reason, because it's kind of the positive take on it. Maybe we should happiness. say the beginning of happiness. The beginning of happiness. <laughs> there we go. Uh, yeah, anyways, so that was kind of like an inside Buddhist joke for those who don't, you know, first noble truth is suffering, and that's kind of the promise is the end of suffering. But um, uh, so when, in your own practice, your own life, did, what was like the day-to-day -day change in terms of, did your family notice any change in you? Yeah, that's a good question because, uh, you know, let's say we were just talk about before or after. I was always the person who was always joking around yeah. and uh, always somebody who, you know, just was very kind of happy-go-lucky, let's say. So my family didn't really notice a lot of changes in terms of, oh, there's some kind of shift there. But uh, I think, you know, when it comes to day-to-day -day conversations, the quality and content of those conversations would have changed. In other words, they would gravitate towards, is what you're doing really worth what you're doing? In terms of, is it actually going to give you happiness? Or is it just impermanent? Yeah. So, almost every conversation started to become a Dhamma talk, as it were. Yeah, uh, uh, you like know, a talk on the a, a talk on practice. a talk on the meditation practice, a talk on, you know, what is happiness, what is joy, or does it make sense to do this or that, yeah. that kind of stuff. So I think they noticed those kind of subtleties in terms of that. But uh, you know, meeting friends after a long time, let's say, yeah. you know, friends who I, I hadn't seen in over five years or in over ten years. They definitely notice a shift because yeah. I was a different person five or ten years ago just by the fact that time has changed somebody. But regardless of that, they did notice uh, certain shifts in terms of there was more wisdom about things. There was more clarity about things. And a lot of my friends were wondering, what is it that you're doing? You know, can you tell me more about this? Yeah. So I've had the, the good fortune to be able to help my friends uh, go towards the beginning of happiness, towards the end of suffering. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, and that makes a lot of sense too. And I think family also, uh, tends to kind of put us in a neat little box and you talk right. about not, uh, f filtering reality. we certainly, when we see our family members, we just think we know exactly who they are and they can't possibly change. But, um, you know, just as far as uh, like the day-to-day -day experience, what you're describing also sounds so radical that someone might expect uh, that person who's just perfectly content to really just stop being a functional human in some ways. Yeah. And so, but, you know, just getting to know you and from what you've said, like, ple like taste still tastes good. There's still pleasure in that sense. Or... Um, you know, there's still like the desire to, you know, or not to, des maybe desire is the wrong word, but just this ability to have like a fun, joking yeah. conversation. So there's not like this, the shift isn't so drastic that someone is becoming an entirely, like a non human being. Right, right. And I think that's a very good point that you bring up, which is a fully awakened mind is one thing, you know, and, and that doesn't mean that the personality. There is, a, there is a personality shift in so far as how you take the world to be. But, you know, the things that you've grown up with, the way that you react, the, the language that you speak, the culture that you come from, the foods that you are used to eating, the friends that you have, the, 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 the inside jokes you have between friends and things like that, that doesn't go away. But what goes away is any kind of expectation from people any kind of expectation of how things should be or a dissatisfaction with situations which are not how they should be. Because there's no idea of what should be and what shouldn't be. Right. So, you know, that mind completely is in the present moment, as it were. I mean, this is a very cliched thing, but it really is just present with everything. It's just always in a, a mode of observing things as they are. So you mentioned earlier, a little bit earlier, about, you know, tastes and things like that. So foods actually taste better. 
you actually have, you know, when you have pleasant experiences, you are fully experiencing that pleasant feeling which means there's no, you know, when we talk about a filtration system, when, you know, you have these sensory data points coming in through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind, it's just fully experiencing it. So I would, I would venture to say that tastes actually are deeper. Mm. Uh, smells are sharper. Your vision is sharper. Hearing is clearer. You know, whatever you experience, you're experiencing fully because there is complete awareness there. Yeah. Complete mindfulness there. It's due to lack of mindfulness that you don't fully experience things as they are, or a person doesn't experience things as they are. Right. And there's always like, what's next? You know, what do I do next? What do I do here? What do I do there? All of that goes away. Right, right. Yeah, I mean, this is so interesting from a scientific perspective because it's really supportive of different theories of how consciousness works, like the predictive processing theory of consciousness. And, um, you know, I understand you've been involved in a study that hasn't been published yet, so you're not allowed to maybe share the, the full results that are, um, like initial results that you know of. But is there anything you could say about, like, what, just generally speaking, when they studied your brain, was there any findings that would support that experience of not adding to experience? Uh, yes, I would say so. Uh, I mean, I can't really explain exactly what the researchers had initially told us about what's going on because the research is, I mean, the research paper is still pending publication. But I could just tell you that it definitely did support a lot of the ideas that we see traditionally from the the ancient texts of Buddhism, specifically about the experiences of what 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 is being experienced in terms of the feeling and the perception. The feeling being the actual sens sensory uh, experience, and the perception being the ability to cognize and understand what it is that is being experienced. What they did notice, and what I can translate from that particular language of of the sutras of the texts is that there's no craving associated with it. So that mind is just basically not grasping at anything. Right. Right. It, there's no like focus on like it has to be this way. There's no focus on that needs to be mine. Yeah. It's just completely, in a sense, defocused, if you want. You use the term sticky too. I think that's yeah. a good analogy. Yeah. So that mind is like a Teflon mind. So like a, it's non-sticky. It's it's whatever comes up, it just completely glides on through. The mind doesn't right. stick to anything. Nothing sticks to the mind. Right. And what that means is, you know, the experience is always fluid. Right. So that mind is always f in flow. It's always in flux because it understands reality as being always arising and passing away. Which means yeah. that things just come and go, and they come and go because of certain causes and conditions. Yeah. So that mind doesn't hold on to it with an expectation of it will always be this way. You know, it understands that whatever has happened has happened, but if those causes and conditions that provided that happening to, to be there, that occurrence to be there, if that goes if those go away, then that's gonna go away as well. The experience is gonna go away as well. Yeah. So that's why that mind isn't focused on anything. Yeah. Yeah, and I think on the extreme end, we can all, well, I think we can all relate to being stuck on something, whether it's a thought that an argument we got into and it just sticks in our mind and it keeps replaying and replaying until finally it burns itself self out. So what a relief if it would just pass through once and then, you know, you're done with it. Um, but I also wanted to mention as far as the research is concerned, that the next guest on the Fit Mind podcast is going to be Ruben Laconen, who's one of the scientists who's studying you. So we can maybe talk more about that part on this next episode. But for now, I thought it'd be fun to do like a small demonstration if you're up for it with the Muse headband. So this is going to measure your brain waves, and then we can show um, we can show it on my phone. And this will be for the YouTube viewers only, <laughs> obviously. So I think it just needs to be touching like the skin of kind of behind your ear. Okay, yeah. Still not, huh? Wait, hold on. It, it takes a little while for it to settle. Yeah. 
so. Yeah, we can also just uh, give it a sec. Okay, so I think we want to do like a pre and post meditation, right? So this is, are you able to see this, David? Okay, yeah, so the caveat is that this is, it is a clinical grade EEG, but it's not as nearly as sensitive as what you'd find in like the lab experiments that you did. Um, but these are the different brainwave frequencies. You have delta, which is the slowest, theta here, purple, alpha, beta, and gamma, which is high frequency. And you can see the different amounts for them. So this is kind of like, uh, just Delson's default state and we um, you know this data would need to be analyzed to really tell how much there is of each frequency but um, I wonder if there will be some kind of a shift if you if you do like a I guess like a one minute meditation well we could try it we could just try yeah. it like a okay see so. Cool. So, I mean, it's really hard to tell what's going on because this is like not giving us specific numbers or anything. But one thing that I noticed or two things I noticed, one was that as soon as you closed your eyes to meditate, there was an immediate massive drop in the and that's not connected, but there was an immediate massive drop in the uh, in all frequencies across yeah. all the bands. And then the other was that the delta was really going up and up into the right um, for much of the session. and. Delta is associated with deep sleep, but it's also associated or what you would expect to find in some kind of cessation where there's, um, you know, the, the mind isn't, it's in a very, very calm or completely inactive state. So thanks for that little demonstration. Good. <laughs> so my, my understanding is that what's been one of the things that's been studied in the lab is cessation which i think you mentioned briefly at the beginning of our talk um this lapse in experientially there's no consciousness there there's just like like a blank spot and you were able to go in for an exact amount of time so like at 10 minutes you said i'll mm -hmm. go in cessation you know they saw just a rapid decline in brain activity and then at exactly the 90 minute mark it booted up. My understanding is you can also go in, you've gone in for up to six days. So what is, the, what is cessation and how does this work exactly? Yeah, so when we talk about cessation, we're referring to a, a specific kind of, let's say non-experience because it's not really <laughs> an experience. 
but it, it's, speci- it's relating to what's known as cessation of perception and feeling, and really that's cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. What that means is there's no more sensory data being received. Even when the eyes are closed, you know, you could still receive sensory data through the ears or through the nose or through feeling on, on the body. Uh, or the mind might be active and thinking about this or that, or there might be some kind of a mental constructive experience or so on. But in the case of cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness, all of that goes away. So the, my, the ear won't take in any kind of sound waves. There won't be any smell being received. There won't be any kind of, if you t- tap the person, they won't feel it. And tied to that, there won't be any kind of perception, which means that there won't be any kind of recognition of what is going on. And consciousness, what we're talking about here, is awareness. So there's completely like a blank. You don't know you are in that state until you actually come out of it. Right. Right. And I think you already alluded to this, but what is the benefit of going into this advanced meditative state? Why would someone want to do this? Yeah. So first we have to understand that there's two ways of looking at it. There's, there's one way of where somebody goes through the whole process of the meditation and they naturally experience cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. And then there's something known as the attainment of, of the cessation of perception, feeling, and consciousness. The difference between the two is that in the case of somebody who's meditating, their mind might shut off for maybe a split second don't really know how long it would have been. But as soon as they come out of it, their mind is utterly pure. This is what we were called as being completely unconditioned. And because all conditions have ceased, including consciousness. So when the mind comes back up again, any kind of contact, any kind of spark that arises is unconditioned, not caused by anything. That initial experience is an experience of nirvana or nibbana. So when we talk about nirvana or nibbana, what we're saying is, you know, near, near or ni means no. And vana or bana, vana in Sanskrit, bana in Pali, it means fire. So there's no greed, hatred, or delusion there. There's no craving, there's no grasping. Mm. There's no aversion there. There's no identification with anything. So that's the unconditioned mind. That's the unconditioned mind. But it also means, uh, vana also, or vana and vana also mean forest. Meaning there's no forest of conceptual proliferation going on. Mm. There's nothing like being added to, you know, there's no groves, there's no, there's no grass growing anywhere. It's just right there and then, pure mind. So that mind is completely unconditioned. That is the benefit of going to cessation, mm-hmm. being able to then experience, yeah. as it were, uh, Nibbana. And there's some kind of a shift that occurs from that even before full awakening, right? Where yes. just having seen how the mind actually works, seeing it kind of boot back up, to use a computer analogy, from cessation, there's some kind of, uh, you can't unsee that now, yeah. you really know how mind works. Yes. And this is what we refer to as dependent origination. What we are seeing is how mind works in terms of how it creates reality. Right. So subjectively, everything that we experience is through the five physical senses and the mind. So we are seeing after coming out of cessation, how the mind creates its own suffering Hmm. or how the mind creates craving whenever there is some kind of a fuel for that craving. So it gets really deep, but what we're talking about are these percolations, these proto-thoughts that arise, give rising to, giving rise to concepts and ideas that are projected onto an experience that can then give rise to full-blown craving, clinging, and then you know suffering down the road. Yeah. So we're seeing that in real time as these things come up and we're able to let them go. The thing is, that mind is seeing it without having to bring it up, because it's always happening. It's actually happening whether you know it or not. But now, when you have this mind that is so pure that it can see things 
at that minute level, it's actually seeing, oh, this is what's happening. Now, in the fully awakened mind, it sees it, but there's no grasping on it. Before that, there's some level of grasping, whether that's some kind of craving, some kind of conceit or idea of a sense of self or whatever it might be. But for the fully awakened mind, there's no kind of grasping of this is me, this is mine, this is myself. Yeah. It's just seeing it and that's it. No, it's just completely equanimous. No feeling of relief or anything because now it's just feeling relief all the time. Okay, okay. So you've, you kind of punctuate that with certain, like a few times and eventually it becomes the default state. Yeah. And then all the time the mind is in this unconditioned right. uh, state where it's not the dependent origination and the chain of causality doesn't, you know, there's still like feelings occurring and stuff, but it's not layering on top all this craving and all this yeah. like ideas of how the world should be or trying to grasp after experiences and whatever it is. Yeah, so basically what we're saying here is that when you come out of cessation, perception, feeling, and consciousness, your mind is pure, which means your mind for that split second is like the mind of an arahant is yeah. fully awakened. But what happens is there is superimposed upon that some kind of clinging of self. There is superimposed upon that like, I want this experience again. Yeah, That's where the craving arises. But if you let go of that completely, wh where those layers of abstraction are gone, then that's it. What had to be done has been done. Yeah. I, I want to bring up a point here because I think a lot of meditation teachers today and spiritual teachers will say the cliche like be here some version of yeah. like be here now or you know it's all about being present you know just just be here it's you know it's that easy but it's not as we all know <laughs> like it's the mind naturally just wants to get away from the present moment and do all this uh filtration all this elaboration and grasping after the next moment, wanting this moment to be different than it is. Yeah. But that's so deeply ingrained that you can't just tell yourself, be here now. This is an actual training process that you've described, is that right? That's correct. That's absolutely right, because that's a wandering mind. So a wandering mind is a mind with craving. Mm -hmm. So when the mind wanders, there's some kind of agitation, there's some kind of craving that's happening. So the six R's that we talk about is a process of deconditioning that wandering mind and then reconditioning so that it no longer wanders. And it's here now, as it were. It's, it's always present, as it were. But you also have to understand that even being present or the notion of being present, even in the present moment, there can be an idea of this is me. There can still be a, a central sort of a person around the present moment. Yeah. For the fully awakened mind, that completely dissolves as well. So, if you talk about the present moment, it's just a concept in that sense. Mm. Is there any sense of an experiencer that's experiencing? Is There's that? only an experience going on. <laughs> <laughs> that's so radical, I, you know, it's tough to imagine. Yeah. yeah, it is because everybody comes from a sense of self. Like, yeah. how could you take away the sense of an experiencer and how could there be just an experience? Isn't there somebody actually observing the experience? And no, as the experience is happening, there is a knowing of that experience. This is what's known as the eye of wisdom or the eye of Dhamma. Right. So just being able to see things as they are, but there's no, there's no grabbing with the sense of I am experiencing it. It's just yeah. an experience. There is a knowing that this experience arose because something led to that experience. Mm. So it's actually just seeing dependent origination all the time, up until the level of feeling. Beyond that, there's no craving. And before that, there's no ignorance because it's always present. Mm. So if someone wanted to, you know, if someone was inspired to start working towards this, this, uh, this training regimen, you know, you've mentioned the six R's. That's something that is taught here at Damasuka. I've also put the six R's on the FitMind app and the, uh, uh, it's called the Deep Path module. Um, so that's really like a meditation practice that they can undertake in, in a sitting sense. 
but just in terms of going about their day, how might they start reconditioning the mind towards, you know, eventually that being their default state? Right. So any kind of meditation, but specifically when we talk about meditation here, it's about being collected. And being collected means that the mind has sustained attention on one specific object, on one particular object. That doesn't mean that it's fully focused, doesn't mean that it's concentrated, doesn't mean that it's one-pointed. What it means is that that, that mind has an anchor to stay here, to stay here and now. And in the, in the, in the course of our practice, we use loving-kindness as a feeling as a psychosomatic feeling that is experienced as loving kindness or compassion or joy or equanimity as we progress. But that experience becomes the anchor to the present. Right. becomes an anchor to being here and now. Then, you know, when you see that you're no longer on your object is how you decondition using the six R's. Right. So I think a lot of people are familiar with using the breath as an object, but here it's often taught, you know, in the way, in the tradition that you've practiced, it's, uh, and this is called the TWIM meditation, Tranquil Wisdom Insight Meditation. Um, the object is this feeling of, of good vibes, of loving kindness, and it's, uh, it's naturally, uh, it feels good for the mind to be with that. I, so that's one reason why I think it's so effective and it also is kind of conducive to this open awareness that's really able to investigate reality as it is, or yeah. experience as it is. Yes, yes. So that 6R process that we use is actually developing wisdom. Understanding and not getting caught up in the distraction. Uh, not having any resistance to the distraction. Not trying to push away the distraction. We're not trying to suppress the distraction. We're recognizing, oh, mind is no longer on its object. Mind is distracted. Okay, no big deal. Release your attention from that. Relax. Let go of the tightness and tension. Let go of the craving. Come back to the smile. Now, the smile is so important here. So people can just start the meditation or start coming into a meditative state if they're just starting. is to stay with the smile. Because the smile keeps the mind uplifted, keeps it light. Yeah. keeps it joyful and playful. So it actually keeps it very present in whatever is going on. And you'll notice when people ruminate, when people start to think about this or that, their smile goes away. Right. So you come back to the smile and you come back to your object. So this is the process. And you can apply the six R's anywhere. It doesn't have to be just meditation. If you notice that your mind starts to pop up with all kinds of ideas resisting to the present moment, not being happy with what's going on, or trying to change it in some way, or having a, a reactivity to somebody saying something, you can notice that. That's the recognized step. You can release your attention from that. You can relax in that moment and come back to the smile or come back to something that's more uplifting. Yeah. And then respond with wisdom, respond with compassion, respond with balance of mind. So the meditation is not just formally sitting and l staying with your object, but it's also being aware of how mind's attention moves from one thing to the other. This yeah. is what we say is the definition of mindfulness, right. meaning you're observing how your mind actually works, and that's where wisdom comes from. Right, right. So you're just observing without interfering. You know, it's an interesting point about the smiling too, because if you just look around at people on the street or wherever it is, a restaurant that you're eating, you see so much tension in their face and so much yeah. like fur so many furrowed brows and so much anger or like, and you can just tell that their mindset must be one of filled with craving. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, you could help them by uh, trying to compliment on something or just pass <laughs> a joyful comment to them. And you see how yeah. their, their eyes light up and how they're happy. This, yeah. is, this is the true understanding of meditation is that it's not just uh, the sitting and walking and everything else, but it's how you interact with people as well. Yeah. So loving kindness is not about just feeling it, but actually being able to spread it through your actions, through your words 
through your intentions. So if you can smile, you'll notice that people start to gravitate towards you naturally. Yeah. And they start to smile around you. Yeah. And it's not something you have to get out, uh, go out of your own way to do. It just naturally translate in, translates into situations and circumstances where people start to feel that kind of energy around you. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, the, the other point that you made that I just wanted to reemphasize is that when you relax, you're feeling the relief before needing to satisfy whatever it is you think you need to make you happy. So if it's the chocolate cake, if you just relax instead of feeling tense and then needing to eat the cake to finally relax, if you just uh, relax that step of the six R's, you immediately feel just as good, in fact, better because you're, you know, you're not full of cake. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and that's a very good point. I mean, we, we talk about at a very extreme level, crimes of passion or people who do something out of reactivity. Mm -hmm. It's just like a split second. It's not even a decision. It's just like they act. But if you can slow things down on, on the cognitive level and realize that, oh, I'm starting to get you know, agitated about this and relax and experience really in that moment when you relax, you're experiencing relief, which is also the third noble truth of the cessation of suffering. Right. So your mind being free of that craving, free of that suffering in that moment is wise so you won't react you won't be reactive to the situation or to the person you'll actually give that space give that time for your mind to take in all that information and because it's relaxed it can bring up something that is wholesome bring up something that is the best outcome for that situation or that person in a sense, I would, I would think that, you know, what you're doing is you're giving your brain the space so that the prefrontal cortex comes up and is able to then really make a proper judgment of things rather than just immediately right. reacting. Right. Yeah, you're no longer a robot. You're responsive and uh, aware of what's happening. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So are you ready for the traditional rapid fire uh, <laughs> final section of the, of the interview? Let's do it. All right, so uh, I know you're a big mo movie buff. What's yeah. your favorite movie of all time? Star Wars, The Empire Strikes Back, and I'll tell you why. <laughs> please do. <laughs> please, please expand. Look, I mean, the whole Star Wars trilogy is great, right? But The Empire Strikes Back is the first time you meet Yoda. And that's the mm -hmm. first time you get really deep wisdom into things that were, you know, the, the Jedi and the Jedi Order were really inspired from the ancient spiritual traditions, right. specifically Buddhism. Yeah. So, and Empire Strikes Back is just a great movie. Yeah. I mean, just in terms of cinematic appeal, it's got a great story, great characters, great script, great dialogue, yeah. all of those things. Now, it is difficult to choose one movie, but I would have to say, since this is a rapid fire, that's yeah. the movie I would choose. Thank you for being so definitive. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, my understanding is Yoda was based off of either Maharishi Mahesh Yogi or a Tibetan Lama. Right. Um, yeah. Uh, was it George Lucas? That was, yeah. 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 He, he clearly did a lot of meditation. And, you know, we, we talk about this here in the meditation as well. People, you know, you give advice to people and you tell them this is what you should try or you should not try. That's the other thing. This is what you should do. Yeah. And then they'll, people will say, I'll try. Yeah, I'll try and that's, my best. I'll try my best. And that's when you say... There is no try. Do or do not. Yeah. And that comes from the Yoda. great wisdom of Yoda. Right? Yeah. So, but Yoda has some great lines that, that allow you to know, you know, like, you know, in, in, uh, in one of the movies he says, he actually talks about dependent origination in some sense. Hmm. He says, fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So he's showing causality and conditionality. Hmm. This leads to this, this leads to that. Let go of this and you let go of suffering. Let go of this, you let go of hate and so on. Hmm. So some great, great quotes by Yoda. Smart. Yeah. Very smart little... Afraid, little are you? Guy. Yeah. No, sir. <laughs> See through you. We can. Be mindful of your feelings. Your thoughts dwell on your mother. I miss her. Mm. Afraid to lose her, I think. Hmm? 
What does that got to do with anything? Everything. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Um, what's something people might be surprised to learn about you? Uh, that I was a screenwriter uh, before I got into the meditative tradition. And I actually, uh, you know, optioned, well, some of my screenplays were optioned by some really interesting celebrities. So, Matt Damon, right? Didn't right. he buy one of your... Matt Damon, yeah. Robert De Niro, a few other people, yeah. So, any idea when that might be coming out? The... You never know with these things. I mean, when it comes to the movies, uh, it can take anywhere from 10 to 15 years for a movie to come out because there's so much stuff to do in pre-production. But yeah. that, that particular uh, script was optioned uh, back in 2000, uh, I'd say 2011 or 12, and then the other one 2013. So any minute now. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'll set a calendar reminder to check back in a few years. Uh, What's one thing that you'd change about the world today? What's one thing I would change about the world today? Yeah, as far as, I guess I should be more specific, like, um, in terms of, I guess, geopolitically or, or kind of just in terms of what people are doing with their lives. Maybe that's a better, better way to phrase it. Well, the way I, w I would look at it is that's just their karma. Yeah. You know, so the way people react to situations, whether it's on a geopolitical scale or the climate change and all of these things, this is why we're here is to experience all of this. So yeah. in my mind, things are okay. Yeah, things are fine. <laughs> it's just causes and conditions, but we have some kind of uh, free, free will is a hairy topic, but it, you yeah, know, there's some kind of decision. There are decisions being made. Right. Uh, and if people were to slow down, as you described, right. and, and use this process of kind of retraining the mind and being more aware, yeah. that might naturally change a lot of things, don't you think? Yeah, so I think one thing we should change is probably get twim to every single global leader. Yeah, <laughs> like right away. <laughs> yeah, right away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, and then finally, what's a place you'd like to visit most in the world? Well, I think a place I would like to revisit again would be back in the Himalayas, going to the cave, mm. you know, and chill there. Wonderful. Um, and, you know, also throw it out for those listening that you're doing this kind of world tour and you're booked through, I think, like through like 2023 now. But yeah. You, you know, if they, I guess if they live in a major city or somewhere at the meditation center, they could, you could probably be in touch with. Uh, yeah, so they should get in touch with. Uh, uh, Suthavada, the Suthavada yeah. Foundation, and send an email to info at Suthavada dot foundation, right. uh, or just go to the go to the website Suthavada dot foundation, and then if they're interested, they can contact right. uh, the people there. So you've got India next uh, for September through. Like November, four retreats there, then Malaysia, Bali, SFLA. So, like yeah, so I got India and then Malaysia and then Indonesia. So I'll be in Jakarta for a couple of days and I'll be in Bali for a few days. And then from there, uh, I'll be going to San Francisco. Uh, I have uh, a time spent over here at Damasuka for yeah. at least three or four months. So that's going to be in Missouri. Uh, and then also something going on in LA. Then from there, I'm going to uh, Europe. So I'll be in the UK, uh, possibly yeah. Netherlands, Belgium, possibly Italy. Yeah. Um, and then who knows where else. And then Australia is another option at the end of 2023. And can people find these on a website somewhere? Or where would they f sign up for the retreats? Okay, so there's a couple of places. One would be, uh, uh, Damasuka would have it, damasuka.org. Uh, Suthavada.foundation, and now, you know, Suthavada has actually created a new website, uh, which is sort of just my kind of calling card, yeah. and that's uh, DelsonArmstrong.info. Oh, nice. You're so, a .info now. Yeah, I'm a .info now. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
Uh, great. So I'll put all those links in the show notes. And um, yeah, I also just want to give you a chance to to plug. Your, oh, and also put a link to your Patreon page, which we're going to yeah. make soon. And then um, I just want to give you a chance to plug your work as far as, uh, you know, where can people find your, your books say, yeah. on Amazon? Right? So Mind Without Craving is on Amazon. It's available for uh, free download on the Sutavada webpage. And it's also available for download, free download on the DelsonArmstrong.info page. Yeah. But uh, it'll be available on, uh, it is available on Amazon as paperback, as hardcover, and as Kindle. And uh, here it is, shameless plug. <laughs> Buy it now or download it free on yeah. those sites I told well, you about. You know, and I should also mention that everything, all of Delson's teaching is for free and it's donation based. Yeah. So, I mean, that model is, I think, kind of rare in, in the world today. And so he really, uh, yeah, I mean, if you could support Delson on, on Patreon, if you think what he does is useful for the world, that would be uh, just a great act of generosity. So anyway, Delson, this has been an absolute pleasure. Thanks for coming on the FitMind podcast. Thank you. I had fun as always. <laughs> <laughs>